Okay, we're going to do a study tonight on the topic of mind control. And uh, we're not going to get into some of the conspiratorial stuff because, uh, quite frankly, a lot of that stuff is a trap. Um, I think Fritz Springmeier, a lot of the stuff that he's put out is actually disinformation. And uh, we're not going to get into a lot of that stuff. I have a video that I did on uh, Mark Phillips and Kathy O'Brien, their book that they did, uh, not Transformation of America. What was the second one that they did? Can't think of it right now. We'll think of it probably. Uh, barred or banned for national security reasons. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But anyways, and uh, what we show in that book, I showed uh, did a little book review. Um, they're actually trying to battle mind control, CIA, MK Ultra, Monarch program, whatever you want to call it. They're trying to battle that with New Age philosophy. And it's like, that doesn't work. Uh, the only way out of mind control is personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And understanding what this book says. You see, this book is uh, very contrary to what people call Christianity. All right, uh, if you read the King James Bible for yourself, you'll see it's, it tells a very different story than uh, what uh, most Christians practice today. But we're going to get into that more as we continue. Um, I'm going to have my wife actually look the scriptures up today and be my reader. Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. Here so we're going to go first. And uh, I'm going to start drawing here a little bit. All right. Mind. Mind control. Okay. That's our subject for this evening. And um, like I kind of said here a little bit, this isn't going to be just talking about the CIA program that was done back in the 60s and 70s and still goes on today, you know, with the higher levels of government types of things and, and whatever. Um, mind control is a lot more prevalent than that. Um, all of us have been subjected to mind control at some level, and we're going to see about that. But uh, we're going to see what the Bible actually has to say about this. Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. Go ahead and read it. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can interpret what a Nicolaitan is. Uh, what I've heard, and I believe it's the true interpretation of this passage, because we're going to see supporting scriptures that support this. So it's not just my interpretation, uh, because you have to compare scripture with scripture. That's how you arrive at the truth. A Nicolaitan is somebody who seeks to rule over the laity. Okay, um, the Catholic priests, the whole hierarchy there, the Pope especially, uh, they seek to rule over the laity. Um, we're going to show you that the King James Bible does not teach that for Christian preachers. Um, preachers are supposed to be actually servants of the people. Uh, we're not supposed to rule over you and call you laity. Uh, we we joking, jokingly talked about that with the uh, Sister Catherine, Dr. Smarty Pants video that we did, you know, I, I, you know, sarcastically act, you know, with that whole thing. But uh, we don't believe that way here at this ministry. Um, we want to see people brought up to our level of understanding because, I mean, we've put a lot of time to study the scriptures. We're, that's what we do. We, we want to disseminate knowledge and, and information and put out studies that, that can bring people up. And, in fact, I love to see uh, people go into ministry for themselves and, you um, the things that have been committed to us, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but you commit them to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Uh, I don't get some Babel building someplace that's worth millions of dollars and have you come and kiss my feet. Okay, it doesn't work that way. Uh, that's not a mark of a New Testament uh, ministry. But you see this thing there of a Nicolaitan. There's somebody that rules the laity. They keep them down on purpose. And God says that he hates it. Jump it over there to uh, verse 15, Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. Read that. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So go ahead and put the Bible down there. Um, go ahead and write Revelation chapter 2, verse just Revelation 2, so people can see it there. Uh, 2... Verse 6 and 15. Okay, that's the first one that we looked up. 
All right, now the next one we're going to go to is Third John, the third book of John. Uh, very, very close there to the book of Revelation. The third book of John, chapter 1. There is only one chapter, but uh, uh, verse 9 through 10. That's so where we're going to go next. You can turn there in your Bible. King James Bible. Better be a King James Bible. The other ones come from the Vatican, and that's a problem. But uh, go next to 3 John 1, verse 9. Go ahead and read it. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrophes, who loveth to have... Diotrophes. Diotrophes who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Okay. What was Diotrephes? Diotrephes was a Nicolaitan. Okay. Um, he didn't verse read verse 10. 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Okay. Um, I've personally seen some diatrophies, uh ministers out there. Uh, they do not want anybody getting up to question them. And they'll, th this is my church, you know. You get out of my church and stuff like that. You know, we've, we've met them <laughs> in person. You know, and some of you out there have too. Uh, very, very prideful, arrogant types of people. Um, let me just show you a little analogy here. This is going to kind of tie in with the whole thing of how mind control works. Because like like we're, we're going to say in this study, mind control is not just CIA black operation type of stuff. Mind control happens in church buildings, which yeah, if you don't know about that, there's no support for it in Scripture to have a building called a church. The body of Christ is the church. Where they meet is, you don't ever call that building a church. Okay, that's Catholicism. And it's, but see again, it's the system. See what's going on there? Diotrephes is saying, hey, this is my church. And if I don't like you, you're kicked out. See? He's a Nicolaitan. Or if you're Bible not in says, the clique, you're kicked out. Yes. Or just, you know, you just kind of are put back in the back part of the church there and we won't pay attention to you. As or invite long you as, over to eat. <laughs> as long as you do your, your, duties to the church such as cleaning and helping out and going to the ladies night events mm -hmm. which are really gossip events yeah and social events such as potlucks and banquets you know things like that mm -hmm. the socialism part if, if you're not saved and you're watching this and you want to get saved don't ever go to a church building okay a lot of people they don't want to get saved because they think oh, i'm gonna have to go to church you don't have to go to church okay no scripture for that. But uh, let me just show you here how this thing works. All right. And then, like I said, this will work with how the CIA does it, with MKUltra, with torturing the victim and things like that to break their, shatter their mind, fragment their personality. And again, if you're out there and you're denying this and going, well, I don't know, this is conspiratorial. There were congressional hearings on it. Okay. This isn't conspiracy. This was being done. It was happening in Nazi Germany. It was brought here to America. All right how to create super soldiers, super spies, super prostitutes, whatever. Uh, it is a big stu subject, very, can get kind of inter intimidating, kind of scary. But uh, the fact of the matter is, it goes on in a lot of other things too. Okay, there's a lot of mind control. Uh, that's why when Jesus Christ was asked about the signs of the end times, he said, take heed that no man deceive you. All right? But, uh, let me just show you how this thing works, okay? Here we have two triangles, very, you know, Illuminati based or whatever here. On this side, we will put a P in this one. That's the programmer, okay? The Nicolaitan, as the Bible calls them. Over here, we will have the V, the victim, all right? The mind control Lee, if you will. All right, now here, they are equal. They are on equal ground. So what does the programmer have to do to the victim? The programmer has to put down the victim. Okay? Put my V there. They have to, in order for them to control their mind, they have to put the victim down through torture, 
both physical and verbal torture and emotional and emotional yes and you know and and that will happen in church buildings i've seen it i've i've gone through it i've had you know been called on the carpet and stuff like this and they will try to put themselves up on the pedestal above you and we're not saying because you know i was in the wrong or something and i should have been rebuked scripturally no 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 we're not talking about that when it comes to authority and you start to get up into the uh pastor you know p could also be programmer or pastor whichever one you know um you know you start to get up into their realm you start to kind of make them a little uncomfortable and they will put you down you'll be called a renegade which i've been called a rebel uh, you're not accountable to anybody and stuff like this which is ironic because i'm accountable to god okay and i am accountable accountable to the body of christ too we both are but see this is how it works right here whether the CIA is doing it or some church building is doing it or a university is doing it, you have your P for professor, you know, and you dare to come and you say, wait a second, uh, uh, professor, I have a question. This doesn't sound right to me. You know what they'll do? They'll put you down. They'll mock you. They'll, they'll put you down in front of the rest of the class. You know, I didn't think that, you know, you're not the one teaching the class or, or whatever else. You don't have the education. That's for a, another course or another st uh, study. You know, you're going to have to, that's an advanced course and stuff. Just shut your mouth. Don't ask questions. What else do we have? We also have military. Okay, if you don't, don't ask questions. Yep. If you don't know my wife's testimony, by the way, if you're new to this, our ministry here, uh, she's been in two branches of the military, served overseas in Iraq, so she knows. And another part of mind control, I, just to let everyone know out there that this is mind control, whenever you hear this little statement, if you're ever in a situation and they tell you, do not write this down, you cannot write this down, that is mind control. They are controlling how you're able to learn the information that they present to you. That is essentially the primary instructional pedagogy, so to speak, the instructional teaching method of spook school, otherwise known as intelligence agency training. And that is their primary form of covering up for their sin. Everything that they do is sin, according to the Bible. And that is mind control when they tell you, you can't write this down. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we see that, and of course, you know, another thing I want to mention, another thing we got to kick while we're at it, and that is the medical field. Okay? Absolutely. Over here you have your doctor, over here you have the patient. Okay, you can just put the, you know, change the letter there if you want to. But the fact is, you start going into the doctor and you start to say, wait a second, I don't want to take that medication. I don't want, I don't think I need that surgery. I don't think I need these tests. They'll say, you didn't go through medical school. You're not a doctor, you know. Mm -hmm. See? It's mind control. And there are people I knew personally. I knew a guy uh, years and years ago. He was on 75 different prescription drugs. And they eventually killed him. And, of course, most of the drugs were to counteract the side effects of the other drugs. You know, now how did he get to that point? Do you think he entered into that level of, of, of deception uh, because his, he still had his mind? Of course not. His mind was controlled by the doctor. He was the patient the victim and the doctor was the programmer mm -hmm. so see mind control is very very prevalent in our day and age it's extremely prevalent and of course there are worse degrees of it i understand that you get into some of the monarch stuff and some of the whatever it gets real bad but let me show you something else here which uh, we were talking about we had this discussion one night and we wrote these little page of notes here that's why i'm kind of redrawing some of this um four the programmer, to keep the victim down, they must continually put them down and down and down and down because you have to stay suppressed. You can never get up to the level of the programmer. Because the, the more the programmer puts the victim down, you know, you, as the saying goes, the idiom goes, if you keep repeating a lie often enough, it becomes accepted truth by the victim. Mm -hmm. And... That's exactly what they have to do to, for the programmer to put the victim down. Okay. Now, does it ever go past this stage? Yes. There will come a point in time when the programmer, draw my triangles here again, the programmer and the victim, 
they will give you a false sense of we're equals. What do you call that? Flattery. They will try to say, oh, you know, I really see some good things for you. I see, I see a bright future for you and everything else. They're still programming you. They're still talking down to you, but they're flattering you and telling you nice things that you want to hear so that they take you to the next level of programming, of mind control. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, the reason we're doing this whole study is because it, it affects so many aspects of our lives nowadays. And, you know, when you get out of this system here, the system of mind control, you'll feel free. You'll be able to serve the Lord without the constraints and things like that. You know, a lot of people, uh, I get this thing all the time, uh, as a preacher, they'll come to me and they'll say, you're not under the headship of a local church, okay? And they say, see, they're trying to do this. They're trying to put me down. I'm over here. They're over here. They're saying, you're not under the headship of a local church. You're a rebel, blah, blah, blah. And they say, you have a good ministry. We think that you're doing some great work for the Lord. We'd love to see you succeed. We'd love to be behind you. You see what they're trying to do? As long as you become a uh, parachurch ministry to their creature of the state 501c3 entity. Yeah, yeah. We were actually offered the, the chance to become paid missionaries, you know, from a uh, Catholic cult that we used to go to. And it was like, uh-uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> You know, they, they lied to us, they deceived us, all kinds of stuff. Now we're going to be paid by them. Sure, sure. But see how it, see how it goes? See? Down here. They're still trying to control you, but they're using false flattery, false praise. And emotions, too. They're working on your emotions by saying, Oh, we love you. We love the work you're doing for the Lord. And that's why we want to support you and pay you. Mm -hmm. Yep. But now we're going to go over here. I'm going to use something different than a triangle. I'm actually going to use a circle. Okay. And I know people can say, well, circles are still somewhat occultic and all this stuff. I know, I know, I know. But you see, here you have a Christian and a lost sinner. LS. Okay. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is the fact that Christians are merely, you know what, where's the eraser at? I'll redraw this. We'll say a SS, and I don't mean super sport. Saved sinner, lost sinner. See, a lot of people think that Christians are self-righteous. Uh, no, if you're truly saved, you are a saved sinner. All right, we are never going to say I'm a good, righteous person. I'm a great person, and things like that. We're both sinners. Uh, we both have done some really, really bad stuff in our past. And that's why Jesus Christ came to, he said, uh, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Okay? So, we had to come to a place where we realized we're sick. We can't save ourselves. We do not have self-righteousness. Our righteousness comes from Jesus Christ and what he did for us. So, we are saved sinners. And see, in terms of our sinful flesh, a saved sinner has all of the capabilities, we are equal, to a lost sinner. Okay? Now, the difference is we're accountable to God. I'm accountable. My wife here is accountable to God. And we will answer to God if we start to mess around with sin. Right over here, you're not answering to God yet. Okay? You're a lost sinner. You serve the God of this world, whether you like it or not. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. That's over here. We are children of God now, so we're going to be punished accordingly, if you're saved. But see, we're on equal ground. I'm a saved sinner. My wife is a saved sinner. If you don't know Jesus Christ out there, then you are a lost sinner. But now here's where it gets interesting. Let's jump down here. What happens next? And this is this is true Christians, by the way. Okay, don't think over here the Babel building, church going variety, religious organized religion thing. Don't compare us to them. Okay, we're different than they are. Uh, read your Bible. Read the King James Bible. You'll see that. Okay, now you have the saved sinner here. All right. The lost sinner decides I'm going to get saved. So the saved sinner puts them down. Right. 
No. The save center comes in to the new convert. And instead of putting down that lost center, a save center that's, you know, has some grace and things, of course, that's also very important, you know, we'll try to lift up that new Christian. Turn to uh, Luke chapter 22. Or no, I'm sorry, uh, what's the next one? First Peter, First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. All right. Here, you know what? You draw that on the board, I'll, I'll turn here. Oh, it actually, it is there already. It's turning, and I didn't even know it. Isn't that awful? First Peter. One through six. Okay. Go ahead and read it. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Stop. Now, you say, wait a second. It said taking the oversight thereof. That means that you're over the flock. Keep reading. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Okay. You see? The job of a pastor of a flock, an elder, if you will, is to take the oversight as a servant. We're going to see that as we continue here. Go ahead, keep reading. Verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed, clothed with humility. For God resisteth, resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Okay, you see it there? You can go ahead and write Luke chapter 22 verses 25 through 27. But you see the thing there of when somebody gets saved, those pastors, the, the preachers, the elders, whatever you want to call them, um, when they have people in their uh, fellowship there, they're actually supposed to, yes, there is oversight. Yes, the younger are supposed to submit themselves in, in the sense of coming and giving respect to a man that's been saved for a while and uh, just simply saying, hey, what does the Bible teach about this or what does the Bible teach about that? But the fact of the matter is that pastor, that elder, is supposed to be humble. And we're going to see where that idea came from here, where Peter got his idea. Of course, we know all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But you're going to see here in this passage, Luke chapter 22, verse 25 through 27. Go ahead and read it. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles ex exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that, that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth? Is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. Okay, so uh, where did Peter get his uh, his idea from there in First Peter chapter 5? Uh, that would be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And if you've read through the Gospels and things, if you haven't, I suggest that you do. But if you've read through the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus Christ often took on the place of a servant. And the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Now, if Jesus Christ could hum humble himself and put himself down here. Now, he wasn't a sinner, but the point is, Jesus Christ could put himself down here. We are part of his body as Christians. And what's he do with the new convert? He serves him. He lifts them up. He does good things for them. You see? See how contrary this is to this system over here of organized religion, of CIA mind control, university mind control, uh, Hollywood mind control, whatever, whatever. And you know, it's, it's, it's funny too, I just want to say this to you younger people out there. If you think celebrities have a good life, uh, you are very sorely mistaken. Okay, um, study the lives of them sometime. I mean, as far as just look at what they get in trouble with all the time. Drugs, alcohol, all kinds of stuff. They are literally, and I use this term because it's a Bible term, 
They are literally whores, okay? Harlots is another word there. Prostitute would be the modern word, but whore and harlot, are, those are Bible terms. Um, they are sold, they're basically slaves. Uh, if they have to promote something, they're going to have to promote it. If they have to go and, and do this and do that and take their clothes off or, you know, whatever else, they're forced to do whatever. And if the uh, devil gets sick and tired of them, a lot of times it's just like, dead. It's a terrible life to be a celebrity. Absolutely tar terrible. And a, and a lot of the occult world out there and everything too, witchcraft or Satanism or whatever else, a lot of it's over here as well. Because you're constantly trying to take the, usurp the position of those in authority above you and get more power and stuff like this. And you're always trying to get more power and you're putting other people down and, you know, cutthroat. Business world as well. Mm -hmm. And the military and academia. Sure. James 1 5. And you say, well, then, uh, so then I have to submit myself to a pastor someplace in order for me to learn the Bible and things like that. Uh, well, there might not be one, a good one in your area. And I do suggest that you watch sermons online. Uh, look for men that preach out of the King James Bible. Um, but, you know, where do you get your wisdom from? Go ahead and read it. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Yep. You see, you're supposed to have a personal relationship with God. And it's interesting because you would think that the God of heaven, the God of the universe, would not have time for somebody like you. You know, a saved sinner. A new convert, but you're a saved sinner. You'd think that the God of the universe wouldn't have time for you. But uh, Jesus Christ made time to be a servant when he was here on the earth. And God himself in heaven, can I, and God and Jesus are one and the same, by the way. It's just the mystery of godliness there. There's a lot more scripture we go into on that. But it's just to understand God and Jesus are one and the same. Okay, But there's a separation there in terms of, of Jesus Christ calling God the Father and, and things. Why? Because man is made up of three parts. Okay, just like the Godhead is, body, soul, spirit. Jesus is the body, God is the soul, the Holy Ghost is the spirit. Again, that's a huge study, but the point is, God himself, the creator of the universe, can help you to understand this book. Okay? He can help you to understand it. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Write that down next. Okay, go ahead and read it. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou there in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath pr promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that, wor that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Hmm. Interesting. So if you come in here, this system here, if you start to mess around and you start to say, well, I have respect, I'm a saved sinner myself, but, you know, I'm not going to respect somebody that comes in as a lost sinner, their new convert, but I'd rather have more respect for somebody that's a little bit more wealthy. Uh, you're starting to head over here. You see? That's a problem. Okay? And, you know, when you have Christians getting together, there should not be an aspect of mind control there. There shouldn't be people trying to push their little agenda and stuff like that. You're all meeting together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're all equal. Okay? 
Um, we could get into that too in the book of Galatians. It talks about these are neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. We are equal. We have equality. You know, you say, well, I want to have equality out there in the world. Never going to happen. You have to pass all kinds of stupid hate crime laws and whatever else to find equality, and you still don't get it. The only way to truly get equality between men and women, between kindreds, also known as races today, um, between different working classes, is right there. Right here. That's equality. Okay? The, the, the goal of the saved sinner lifting up the new convert is to bring them up to everybody else's level. Okay? Not to try and run them and put them down and stuff like this over here. All right? Chalk. <laughs> uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. I'm just going to put your chalk over there because I don't think I need it okay. right now. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Okay, so you see it again. You see the thing there again of... Move to your left there a little bit. Thank you. Oh, really? Uh, you saw that? Okay. I got you. <laughs> Always making trouble. But this, you see some... the thing here again of the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. That's what I quoted earlier. Who shall be able to teach others also. See, the, the body of Christ supports one another. And we say, okay, let's lift each other up. And I'm very, very glad I see a lot of people write to me and they say, you know, I've learned so much from your ministry, and I think, well, you know, praise the Lord, that's great. And then I see them getting into ministry themselves. That's the point of why I do this, why we do this now. You know, the Lord brought me my wife here so she could help me out in the ministry. And, you know, if somebody's out there going, eh, you know, writing a stupid comment, you know, she's a female preacher now. So she's reading the Bible, okay? You know, she's not preaching to anybody. Give me a break. You know, but not pastoring in terms of the body of Christ getting together and she's trying to run the thing or something. You know, give it a rest, you know. But uh, let's continue here. Uh, next we have 1 Corinthians 10. Go ahead. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 5. And, you know, a lot of times I'll try to go through scriptures, you know, from the front to the back of the Bible. See, so it's all just kind of, you know, you kind of go through the Bible. But... These were just kind of coming to me, and I was just writing them down and everything for this specific study. So they're not quite organized. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 1, read down to verse 5. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud. Wait a second. Sorry. 2 Corinthians. I had that typed out wrong. 2 Corinthians. Oh, okay. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Yeah, I guess it would help if I'm in the correct chapter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Always goes easier that way. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, Wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay. Now let me just stop there. Read over in Ephesians chapter 6 sometime. We're not going to go there. But read over in Ephesians chapter 6. What's the weapon? My wife's holding it. King James Bible, the Word of God. Right there is your weapon. The most powerful weapon on the earth is that King James Bible right there. And if you have been mind controlled, this is the key out. Okay? You see, but I, I don't understand. 
Remember what we read in James chapter 1, verse 5? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. You know what upbraideth not means? He won't, he won't uh, mock you. He won't put you down. You come to God and you say, I'd like to understand this book. God's not going to go, <laughs> you, of all people, you, uh-uh, no, 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 no. God's going to say, hey, sure, what do you want to know? I'll teach you. I'll teach you this book. And look what it does for you. Read uh, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see that? If you have been put through some kind of mind control, if you've been put down and put down and put down like this, you know, some programmer has turned you into the victim, the way that you can defeat that thing is to know this book. Because this book is, it's been, it's been well said, it's been, uh, I heard a guy say this one time and I've always remembered it. He said, this book is pre-recorded history. This book is going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. And the fact of the matter is, this Bible says that there will come a day when every knee is going to bow to Jesus Christ. And that everyone is going to die and they're all going to give an account. There's going to be a judgment that's coming. Okay? So, this is the weapon right here. You can, read, you can write down the next one a while. Galatians 3, 1 through 3. This is going to be the weapon right here that is going to bring you out of your mind control. If you're in some Babel building someplace and you're going, I just don't understand. I, I have a problem with what's happening here and I try to talk to the pastor about it and I try to talk to the deacon about it and I try to talk to this person and that person. All these people, I know what the Bible says and they're not doing things right and all that ever happens to me is this and a little bit of this occasionally. Oh, we do respect you and we do respect your opinions and everything else, and, uh, but you're not in authority here. You see? See how All that about works? The money. Sure, absolutely. First Timothy 6, verse 10. Amen. But uh, is it 6, 10 or 9? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. 10. Okay. Sorry, verse 9 is for they that will be rich fall into temptation and a, and a snare. Okay. I mean, to more, many foolish and hurtful us, which drown men in perdition and destruction. But anyways, uh, we're Bible fanatics, okay, sorry. We, we quote the scriptures to each other all the time. Uh, we're, we're a little odd, I guess, in this world's uh, eyes, but <laughs> that's okay. It's fun to be odd. But, uh, you know, once you understand the Bible, that's the key that's going to unlock things, okay? That's the key that's going to get you out of mind control. Because this Bible is, is accurately predicting everything that's going on today in this world. And it's accurately predicting what's coming in the future. And it gets all these prophecies right. It gets history right. And so it's also going to get the thing of judgment, coming judgment right. And if you get to that judgment in your own self-righteousness, um, you're not going to make it. If you get to that judgment as a new creature in Christ Jesus, a saved sinner... You'll make it. You'll be okay. But the only way to come out of mind control, the only way, is not through psychiatry. Good night. Do not go to psychiatry. Okay, psychiatry is founded on the same principles as mind control. Okay, the doctor puts down the victim. Sit on the couch there. Tell me, let's go back to your childhood. You know, and all this stuff like that. Well, why? See? And they'll, they'll even throw an EEG, electroencephalogram. I remember hearing that word from time to time growing up because my mother is, was and still is a medical goon. So I'm very mm -hmm. familiar with the process of EEGs. Anyhow, that is one of the things that they might tell you you have to endure after your counseling session with them if they feel that you're not um, oh, conformable to their image of what they, what they see in their textbooks of... Um, mental illness, mental hygiene, you know, uh, mental diseases, so to speak. And yeah. they'll They're... tell you, oh, uh, why didn't you respond in such and such way? And if you say something like, I've gone through this, so I speak from experience here. If you say something like, well, I didn't know, I've never been trained in that. They'll say, is there something wrong with your head? I think we need to recommend you for an EEG or an MRI. You know, I've gone through that too. Mm -hmm. and, and, and 
it's right back to that system again. Okay, so stay away from psychiatry, stay away from the medical establishment, and whatever else. If you're having trouble, and uh, you know, why don't you go to the one who actually created you? And uh, you know, they, they say, do you have an owner's manual for this or an owner's manual for that? This is your owner's manual right there, King James Bible. Okay, but uh, Galatians three, verses one through three. I'll show you another thing here. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Okay, very interesting word there. Bewitched you. Hmm. Uh, what was the definition of witchcraft that you that you read? Uh, well, I don't have the the quote verbatimly memorized, but the key buzzwords are essentially changing, uh, bending, bending, distorting reality. And yes. you know whatever changes, bends, and distorts reality. Okay, and that's what a lot of these people do. What's going on here in the book of Galatians is you actually have Jews that are coming to Gentiles, save Gentiles, and they're saying, you have to act, you know, go back under the Old Testament, go back under, keep the law and all this other stuff. And Paul comes along, and, you know, the Apostle Paul, and he comes along and he says, who hath bewitched you? Who is uh, mind controlling you? You see, this is the technique that they did here, and of course a little bit of this one too. You know, instead of saying, oh, no, actually, we're equal, Jews and Gentiles, they came along and they said, no, actually, us Jews are far superior to you Gentiles. And there are, you know, the Jews do have advantages and things, I'll, I'll grant you that. But the point is, in Christ, we're all one. We're all equal. Down here, they also used bewitchment in the sense of, uh, well, we really think that you have some great promise and we see great, bright future for you. All you need to do is just, you know, Get a little bit more education and be part of a local church and, and just just do some good things and, and community service and, and wouldn't it be great? Uh-huh. You see how it works? You see how it works? Okay. So you're seeing it there. Don't let anybody bewitch you. And I'm talking not just saved people over here, you know, that you gotta watch out for and stuff like this. I mean, there are saved people that still have they still have flesh, they're still saved sinners. They can still mess up. I'm not just talking about Christians. I'm talking about, be it government officials, uh, doctors, uh, whatever, your employer, whatever else. Don't let them bewitch you. Even family members. Especially family members. Look out for that. Uh, next is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, verses... 1 through 6. Okay, go ahead and read it. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is, that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth, preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not, which ye have not accepted, ye might, bell, ye, ye might well bear with him. Tongue twisted. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, for though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Okay. So what do we see there? We see Paul warning this time the Corinthians. See, this is this is a classic thing with, with Christians. There are all kinds of false prophets out there and everything. And they will come along and they'll try to get control over you. They will uh, mind control you. You get what I'm saying? Okay. Only this time they were coming and they were actually preaching a totally different gospel. You know, uh, this this 
gospel, one of the, the famous gospels that's preached today, is uh, Jack Hiles was really the uh, founder of this whole false gospel of easy believism, quick prayerism. You know, you just get, I mean, he'd get whole busloads of people, say, bow your head, pray this prayer, repeat it after me. And he'd look and he, after he's done, he'd, you know, get him to say a couple of things that we believe in Jesus, believe Jesus died for our sins, blah, blah, blah. They didn't even know what they were saying half the time. And, but they'd go, oh, 300 people saved. No, 300 people led into false prayers that they don't even know what they're saying, okay? And Jack Hiles was a master mind control expert, okay? If you ever see his, his, any of his sermons, and I don't recommend watching the guy, but if you ever want to be, if out of curiosity, you just say, I'm just going to watch a little bit, he uses mind control tactics unreal. I mean, he is a master mind controller. He's burning in hell. I don't have any doubts about that. The guy was a sex pervert. He was money hungry. I mean, just, he was a very, very bad man. He was a liar, a hypocrite. I have a four-part study on the guy. He's a very, very wicked man. But the point is, he was a master at this over here, these two things. And Paul looks at the Corinthians and he says, I'm afraid, you know, I am the guy that came and, and taught you about Jesus Christ here as the apostle, uh, but there are other false preachers coming along that, that are trying to get you through subtlety, like Satan does. And he goes on that same chapter, chapter uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he goes on, on to actually say that Satan's ministers appear as the ministers of righteousness. So look out for these church buildings. I'm telling you what, I'd stay far away from them. But let's continue. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 through 7. Oh, you have it written down right there. Okay. Well, Fast. the chalk, me, the chalk actually. Yes, yes. Three. Get to reading it. For of this sort are they which creep into houses <laughs> and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. And if you want to read the other verses there, verses 1 down through uh, verse 5. Uh, it's very instructive of these last days that we're in. Um, you know, and it says there in verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Uh, hello, <laughs> you know, ta-da. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, very perilous times have come, in, indeed, definitely. But you see this thing there. They'll come in and they'll actually look for women. They'll actually go after women. And this, you know, the Bible does not put women down, by the way. It's not like Islam or something like that. The Bible recognizes the fact that women are very, very sensitive. They have different emotions and things that men do. And that's not bad. It's a good thing. That's the way it's supposed to be. But Satan understands that women uh, are more emotional and, and more sensitive. They can feel things, many, many times be a lot more spiritual than men. And the devil knows that. So he goes after the women. You see, women... My wife here, her job is to guide the house, okay? Give none, none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And the Bible says, for some are already turned aside after Satan. That's First Timothy chapter 5. But, uh, you know, the job of the woman is to guide the house. And the Bible talks, too, about uh, a contentious woman or things like that, you know, and a woman that plucks down her house with her own hands, you know. Why? Because Satan got her. How did sin enter into the world? Through Eve. What was Eve doing? She got away from Adam. And she started talking to another man. Satan. And Satan caused her to sin. And Adam saw that and he was like, oh, boy, you know, she's going to die. I'm going to die with her. You know, very beautiful picture there of what Jesus Christ did for his bride. Again, it's another study. But the fact of the matter is, people, men out there, will try to use and abuse women. And again, that's such a tragic thing. You can see some of her testimony and, and things. Uh, young women do not understand what goes through the mental process of a man. And they think, I can dress in a way that shows off my body. You know, if I got it, I'm going to flaunt it. That kind of a mindset. And they think to themselves, they see men looking and they hear them whistling and whatever else. And they think, oh, wow, I'm controlling the man. No, actually, that's not it. The man looks at you with the attire of an harlot on and he says, I can control her. I can program her as my victim. 
through pickup I, lines. And I get getting ahead of me. You put in my hand, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Down here, exactly, through pickup lines. See, you know, she knows. See, they use flattery. Oh, I, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Oh, where were you at all my life? And uh, you know, all this stuff like that. And then when they get their way, then they do this. You see? Then they put the victim down. Mm -hmm. And I've seen women, uh, I, I've known of, a, of different women and things like that that have been just used and abused just all their lives and they get to be an older woman and they just see the, the age in their, in their face and things like that. I mean, they just lost all their beauty because they've just been used all their life. It's sad. It's very, very sad. So again, Bible standards are, are what you want to really live by. But uh, one more place to turn to, Romans chapter 16. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. And we're going to see another scripture talking about mind control here. And there's, you know, there's a lot more we could go over. This is just going to be a short little video, a quick study. But uh, Romans chapter 16, we're going to see a good example of this down here again. The flattery that's used. Romans 16, verses 17 through 18. Go ahead. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Good words and fair speeches. Did you get a hold of that one? What do we have? Right there. Okay. And what are they really trying to do? They're trying to get you away from sound doctrine that will lift you up to their level. See? They don't like that. I actually knew a preacher the one time that had a really good analogy. He said, lost sinners, it's like they're sinking in quicksand. And saved sinners are supposed to be out on the dry ground and pull them out and up. You don't jump down into the quicksand and to make the lost sinner feel comfortable. Okay, and he was talking about using rock music or whatever else to try and win the lost with lost things. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. Okay. Now as Christians we're supposed to come along as saved sinners and when there's a new convert or whatever else we're supposed to lift them up. Uh, all of us, you know, the Bible talks too about that if there's judgment to be done, some matter or whatever, you're to, to set those who are least esteemed in the church to be the judges. Very contrary to what we read over in the book of James. You know, so please, if you have been subjected to some form of mind control, and I'll tell you what, everybody has, okay? If you watch television, um, you're really lousy unless you drive a new car, you see? Or if you don't have a iPhone or an iPod or an yep. iPad or a smartphone of all different sorts or a, exactly. an e-reader of some sort. If you don't have the latest technology, you're, you know, made not to feel, cool. Yeah, you're made to feel like pond scum. I mean, you're just no good. If you don't have the latest style, you know. If your hair you isn't perfect, <clears throat> you won't get the respect of, you know, depending on, on what gender you are. For me... You know, it was, you'll never get a guy's attention if your hair isn't perfectly done all the time. That's what I was told from my family members. Yeah. Not so much a problem for me, but, you know, the difference is here. But <laughs> if you have been subjected to some form of mind control, okay, and we can laugh about this. You know, it's a serious, serious subject. I know there are people that are really tormented in things because of the mind control that they've been through. Uh, we're not laughing at you or laughing at your problems. We're laughing because we have joy in the Lord, because we've come out of mind control. Um, both of us have been subjected to different levels of mind control. My wife here a lot more than me, and, um, you know, she's been through some really bad stuff. But, uh, you know, both of us have been subjected to this whole system over here, okay, being put down, people using fake flattery to try and keep us in their system. Um, we've both been through it. And I know a lot of you have been out there as well, especially with the Babel building thing. Uh, you've been through that whole thing like that. And what breaks this mind control spell right here is when you start to read the Word of God, the Bible. As a saved sinner, you try to lift other Christians up. 
and serve other people. You know, and you'll see very quickly that uh, in the Babel building system, a lot of the service goes away because you're too busy trying to keep the thing going and whatever else. I mean, again, another story. But the only way out, the only way out of mind control in any facet is a personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and that book right there. This is the only weapon of warfare that can break mind control. Not psychiatry. Psychiatry was, was invented by people that use mind control. Okay, Secular people. That their whole system is based on, I'm the doctor, you're the patient. Nicolaitanism. What does God say about Nicolaitanism? He hates it. He can't stand it. All right. So the only way for you to ever get out of this is God's Word and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. And by the way, you say, well, uh, where do I have to go to uh, get this personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do I have to travel to Vatican City? Oh, please don't do that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, do I have to come to the ministry headquarters here? No, no, no. You don't need to come to us. Uh, you don't need to come and pay our uh, mortgage on our $2 million building and stuff like this with a professional studio. No. You can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ right where you are right now. You don't have to wait an hour. The Bible says about now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You can get saved right now. And we can go through all the scriptures and things, but I'll save you the time. You can see the scriptures on your screen. You don't even need to have a King James Bible right now. Go to the main channel at our ministry and uh, watch the salvation message. And okay. I just want to say this. God is nigh unto all who call upon him. And I can tell you, as a matter of fact, from years and years and years as a lost sinner before the Lord Jesus Christ saved me from my sins, after I repented of being, you know, such a wicked sinner, there were so many different situations I called out to God for help, you know, just about any place you could think of to cry out to God for help, you know, I cried out to God so many times as a lost sinner, and I said, God, please help me, you know, help me get through this. And let me tell you, he answered my prayer in a very powerful way every single time. I ran out of gas, you know, and I cried out as I was driving and looking at my, at my uh, gas tank gauge that was literally on E and somewhat past E in various situations, and I said, God, please help me find a gas station. I don't know what I'm going to do if I run out of gas and I'm here on the road and there's cars coming, you know, driving past me and everything. And just a moment or two later, I see a green and white colored sign that says gas station on your right, you know, and I pulled over and the, the Lord answered my prayer. And that's just one of numerous examples. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times the Lord knows. And let me just interject something here too. Before I was saved... Um, I was an artist, and uh, I remember the one time I left my studio, it was about 4 o'clock in the morning. I was like up just all night just agonizing, trying to get work done and whatever else. And I was a wood turner, artistic wood turner, wood carver, and I was selling in art galleries and all kinds of going around to these big art shows and everything else. And I was just so frustrated because I was like, I'm not getting any joy from this anymore. And I remember I walked out and I looked up, at the sky and I said God I know you're there and I said uh, I just want wisdom I didn't know James chapter 1 verse 5 that if you lack wisdom you're to ask of God I had no idea and see God will answer the prayers of a lost sinner that is looking for him don't think that you can say I'm just going to continue in my sin and I'm just going to use God as my little bellhop or bellboy or something like that. Hey, I need help with this or I need help with that bill or something and God will answer you. No, 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 no. That's not the point here that we were trying to say. She was looking for God. Truly that personal relationship with God. That's why God would hear her prayers. Even as a lost person, God would say, yeah, I'll help you out of that situation because you're coming towards me. God helped me. He heard me. He heard my prayers as a lost man because I was going looking for him. Okay, He is nigh unto them that call upon him. In other words, he is near to you. And He's I will, right there. And I also want to include one last little fact about when you call upon God for help. Um, as a lost sinner, there were so many times 
um, in academia and the military. In every situation I was in, I kept on saying every time I tried to move to a new location thinking, okay, I'm going to find some answers. Maybe somebody will help me out of my situation. Nobody helped me. I had to learn the hard way with God's help as a lost sinner how to get out of the system, the mind control that I was under. But let me tell you this. I cried out to God so many times. And again, he knows exactly how many times I did this. I said, I just want a changed life. I just, I want a new life. You know, I, I said that I don't know how many times. I cried out to God for help and I kept on saying, I just want a new life. And let me tell you, that is, that is a definite sign of a person who truly comes to God as a repentant, contrite, and broken sinner for salvation and says, God, I'm a wicked sinner. Please save me from my sins. I can't do it on my own. You know, that's what we both did when we cried out to God for, for salvation years ago. Mm -hmm. And when you truly get saved, there will be a change in your life. Absolutely. And it's, and you know, the, the funny thing is, if you're lost, you know that. You know that, that you want to have a changed life. And we're, the reason we're saying this is because, again, you have people over here in this system of mind control that try to tell you that you can be saved and yet there's no change. And it's, you know, you don't understand the scriptures like we do and all this other stuff. It's a very, very wicked thing. So please, please, if you have been through some level of mind control, everybody has, depending on how bad it's been, how serious it's been, please do not put Christianity, Bible-believing Christianity, the real deal, over into this realm. It's not there, okay? The Bible is very clear. You saw the scriptures over here. They're, they're right there. You can look them up yourself. You know, you're actually standing in front of the Sorry. deer this way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but you see the scriptures over there that you can look it up and you can see God never set up this system over here. Okay, the system of organized religion. The Lord is saying, okay, this is the way it's supposed to be right here. If you're saved and you know somebody that recently got saved, lift them up. Be a servant to them. So let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you that we're not left in the dark down here. We, we can know you. We can know that uh, our future is secure. And I thank you so much for what you did on the cross, Lord, to pay for our sins. And that uh, your word says that whosoever will, uh, anybody at all can get saved. Uh, you'll not turn away anyone. And you won't control people and, and put them down and belittle them if they come to you and ask for your help for salvation, for knowledge. Um, and I thank you for that promise, Lord, from your word. And Lord, I just pray for anybody out there that's watching this that has been through mind control and they know it, and they have been put down and they're put down by other people. I pray, Lord, that uh, that they would rely on your word, uh, the weapon of their warfare, and uh, not on psychiatry, not on any kind of other system that will get them right back into the system of mind control. Uh, help them, Lord, to get out of mind control through your word, through that personal relationship and nothing else. And um, I can just pray it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, and I'm going to leave you with that thought. Um, many, many systems out there, especially within the medical field, are specifically designed as catch nets for people who have been through mind control, real mind control, you know. Um, they want to bring you back here. They want to put you, you're the victim, they want to program you, and you're just, uh, you got a problem, you have mental illness, and we're just going to medicate you now, and stuff like that. See? See? And, or they'll use flattery. So, do not fall for any kind of medical stuff, any kind of psychiatric evaluations, or anything like that. Just get as far away from that stuff as you can. And, you know... Even I just want to say this as an encouragement to Christians out there, some of my brothers and sisters in Christ. I know that you really get put down a lot by uh, family members, by other Christians and things. Um, they're trying to bring you under mind control. Okay? Uh, oh, you're one of those King James only people. Oh, brother. Oh, you believe in the rapture. Oh, you know. see what they're trying to do? See? They're trying to control you. Stand by the Bible. Right there. If it doesn't say it in there, then you don't believe it. 
The Bible talks about continuing in the things that you've learned and been assured of. As a Christian, you're supposed to be stubborn, very stubborn. Somebody comes along and they say, that King James Bible has errors in it. You say, no, it doesn't. Well, I can prove it. Well, and maybe in your feeble little mind you can, you know, but uh, it doesn't have errors in it. Hey, that uh, rapture thing, that's a lie that was created by Jesuits and things like it. No, it wasn't. That's a lie. Okay. Not at all true. And you say, well, uh, do you have any, uh, somebody asked me recently, that's why it's coming to my mind. They said, uh, do you have proof that the Jesuits didn't create the rapture? Well, <laughs> uh, common sense is the proof, all the proof that you really need. And I mean, you didn't get, get these guys, well, I can prove that, you know, some Jesuit named Ribeiro created the rapture or something like this. And, uh, you know, okay, what's your source? Oh, some internet article. And the internet article links to another internet article. And this links to that list, that links to this. Nonsense. Okay, there's no proof at all for Jesuits creating the rapture. Give me a break, okay? It's clear in the scriptures. You can clearly see it in the Bible. So how could Jesuits create it when it's in your King James Bible? The Jesuits hate this book. They tried to bring out their own, the Dewey Reams, in 1610, a year before this was finished. Okay, it was the Jesuit Dewey Reams, it was known as that. All right, I have a copy of it, official copy from the Catholic Church, the original deal and everything, it cost me a lot of money. But uh, the fact of the matter is, this teaching that the Jesuits, I just want to address this here very quickly. If you're watching, I hope that you are the, you know, the people that asked me the question. Um, the Catholic Church in their catechism, and I have a pre trib rapture moment on this, the Catholic Church in their catechism says that the church has to go through a final time of purification. Okay, they do not believe, the Catholic Church has never believed or taught a pre-tribulation rapture, more properly called the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away of the body of Christ, if you want to go with a real biblical term. So, anybody comes along and says, well, the Jesuits created it, you just go, I don't think so. You're not going to uh, control me, Okay. Uh, I'm going to stand firm to the things that I've learned and been assured of. Uh, another big thing right now that I've talked about last week's study is this thing of Lordship Salvation. If you say there's repentance, there's a changed life after salvation, they'll say, oh, you're a Lordship Salvationist. Uh, again, the, the term appears nowhere in Scripture. They can define it however they want. Um, and this Edward Fenninger guy, actually, I checked out his channel just to see if he had a response to me. And, and of course he did. And he said... He openly lies about me. I said, belief only is a false gospel. He says, faith only is what I said. That's a lie. Okay? Absolute liar. And that's what you're going to deal with. Okay? little piece of advice for you. If you get saved, your worst enemies are going to be other professing Christians. Right there. Okay? Keep that in mind. The worst enemies that you will ever have as a Christian are other professing Christians. You say, well, how can I tell them things? Weapons of our warfare? You got it? Do you understand? The book. All right. That will be it. We thank you very much for watching. And uh, please keep us in your prayers. I guess that's it. So, see you next week's study.